but the lectures that I'm going to give you about will cover aluminium, titanium, and iron, and basically all the important engineering metallic alloys. Of course, there are many, many other metallic materials, but we use them in such small quantities that it's not appropriate to deal with them in this series of lectures. So I'm going to begin with aluminium today, but uh, at the same time, I want to show you roughly the sort of properties we are looking at and in your handout you've got this table which lists uh, the properties of magnesium, aluminium, titanium and iron. First of all we have density and you can see that there are large variations in density. Iron of course is the densest of all these materials. Density on its own is not a useful measure. Uh, we have to think about properties such as specific strength and specific modulus. So for example, if I take the modulus of magnesium, which is 45 gigapascals, and that of iron, which is 210 gigapascals, and I scale it with density, then you can see that they are more or less the same. Because when we are designing engineering structures, it isn't simply a question of one parameter, but a combination of parameters which gives you uh, a good selection criterion. And you're going to have a course specifically on the selection of materials where we, you'll be using combinations of these parameters. And in terms of melting temperatures, you can see titanium melts at the highest temperature. So you can imagine that you might use titanium in high temperature applications, but in fact, you don't use it beyond around 450 degrees centigrade. And you'll discover the reason for that later on in the lectures. Now, in terms of crystal structure, which one of these crystal structures do you think is the most brittle, and why? Hexagonal, you are absolutely right. Why is that? That's right. You've only got basically three slip systems in the basal plane. You can actually have further slip systems if the CORA ratio, that means the lattice parameter ratio, is not ideal. But why does having three slip systems make the material brittle? Well, each slip system would have to move more than if you, if you have three, then they each have to move more than if you had a whole bunch of that whole move away from you. And so if you're really stressing the slip system, then you're going to be able to. Yeah, I mean, uh, you've got a restricted number of slip systems. And supposing we think about a polycrystalline material. So we've got a set of grains. And if I deform it, in principle, this grain can deform into a particular shape. So this is after deformation. Now, if the grain over here can't accommodate exactly that shape change, okay, so in other words, this particular grain has to deform in exactly that manner, then you will develop a hole, and the material is said to be brittle. Yeah. So if you don't have enough slip systems to accommodate an arbitrary shape change, then a polycrystalline material will be brittle. Now, have you done any elasticity theory as yet? Okay, so at some stage you'll be doing elasticity theory, and that tells you that you need five slip systems in order to produce an arbitrary change of shape. So for a polycrystalline material to be ductile, you need to have five slip systems. And the hexagonal system doesn't have that if the C over A ratio is ideal. So in general, you know, for example, magnesium is not a very important structural material. However, it is very light. And in applications where the stresses, etc., are not onerous, you can still use it. So there's more and more magnesium, for example, coming into car components, which simply because of its lightness. Now, of course, with the cubic systems, we have many slip systems, something like 24 uh, different slip systems, and that's the reason why they are very ductile. Now, in terms of the amount of these metallic alloys that we produce, uh, Steel is by far the most successful metallic material, and you discover why. 
we've got about a billion tons being produced every every year. And it's followed by titanium, which is of the order of uh, 500,000, uh, 50 million tons. Okay. And then titanium, which is less than a million tons, and similarly magnesium. Now, it is possible that things will change radically for titanium. And you know, do you, are you aware of the process that has been discovered in this department for the extraction of titanium? So the normal way in which you get titanium from titanium oxide is that you convert the titanium oxide into titanium tetrachloride. You react that with magnesium to liberate the titanium and that titanium is in the form of a sponge which has to be broken up out of the reactor. So it's a very expensive way of getting titanium out of titanium oxide. Uh, the new process involves making an electrode out of titanium oxide and by electrolysis you simply get titanium powder. So it's a very elegant process which is bound to reduce the cost by a very large amount and then we might have much greater production of titanium. So yesterday there was a lecture in the Cambridge Philosophical Society given by Professor Frey specifically on this issue. Uh, the cost of producing, uh, the energy cost of producing these elements is also extremely important. You can see here the current cost of producing a ton of titanium is very high indeed. Okay, so that's uh, an idea of the properties of the elemental metals. And again, I, I list here the density. The big disadvantage of iron is density. But remember that the vast majority of applications are terrestrial and you don't need to worry about the weight so much. We have modulus and the specific modulus is more or less the same for all of these metals. Production of iron outstrips every other metallic material put together. And of course, cost is extremely important. If you're building very large structures, you can't possibly afford the sort of cost that we have with titanium, etc. In fact, if you work it out, the cost of iron and steel is, weight for weight, is about a thousand times less than that of potato crisps. So it's an incredibly cheap material. And that's why we can make very large structures. Now, you've heard a lot about the materials that go in cars. And, you know, if you ask the layman, they will have the impression that, you know, in the future we will make cars out of, you know, carbon nanotubes and all the rest of it, because there's so much hype about these things. I want to show you that it really isn't true, because the sort of materials listed here have incredible properties, and they really haven't been beaten by any of these so-called modern materials. So this is the distribution of weight in European cars, 1990. And for, of course, if you go to the USA where they make excessive use of cars and very large cars, then this table will be different. But this is the European situation where we have more sensible cars. Do you mean SUVs? Um, SUVs are included in this analysis. Okay. What did you call uh, The American cars tend to be large. Yeah. 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 So whether it's an SUV or, or you know, a five-door hatchback, they tend to be larger. Um, and you know, if you think about the smart car, which is a tiny car you might have seen here, they consider that to be roadkill. You know, <laughs> those little toy cars. Oh, we yeah. <laughs> we love that. We love that concept. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sort of criticizing Americans. I'm just giving oh, you yeah. the facts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, so this is the distribution of um, the different materials in cars. 61% iron and steel. We have non-ferrous uh, materials, for example, magnesium, aluminium. Uh, plastics, very important, 11%. And glass is actually a structural material as well. It is very strong because of the way in, it, in which it's been heat treated to make it tough. Rubber and other materials. And the total weight of a European car, 1990, <laughs> was 900 kilograms. Okay. Now, you might imagine that with all the advances we've had in materials, you would have reduced that weight considerably. 
Uh, first of all, the distribution of the different kinds of materials is not different. If I add up steel and iron, it comes to 65%. So it's actually increased in proportion in cars. If you looked at 1990, it was 61%. It's gone up. And the reason why it's gone up is because we have very strict safety regulations now, where you, you know even side impact is an important consideration in the design of car. And seals are very good at providing crash resistance. So your doors, for example, are reinforced with very high strength steel bars to take side impacts. Um, so the total weight of a car in 2002 is actually higher than in 1990 because of that. I think it's, this is a North American, so you may or may not be. This Sorry. is American rather than European, so. Okay. Uh, okay. And the other question, your caption for table two says due to value in ECU. The ECU is the same as the euro, isn't it? Well, you know, this is, uh, this is known as an European currency unit, okay? So it's something which has been normalized to take account of fluctuations in rates and so forth. It's not exactly a euro, but it's. It's an analysis method which is based on a European currency unit. This is a very good example which illustrates uh, changes in automobile design. So this is the Austin Mini in 1959. And this is the latest, uh, the BMW Mini, 2001. And look at the weight of the Austin Mini in 1959. It's about 600 kilograms. And the latest one is about 1,050 kilograms. Entirely because of engineering design and safety issues. This would not be acceptable as a modern car. It, it simply doesn't have the sort of crash resistance, etc., that would be necessary for a modern car. Notice that the performance figures are higher for the new BMW. This has a brake horsepower of 90 compared with 37, and a much higher maximum speed, and a much higher power to weight ratio. And yet, because of improvements in technology, you know, we have actually a lower fuel consumption. So, cars have improved enormously. The weight has not necessarily gone down. Okay, so let's now start uh, to deal with aluminium. And we'll start with pure aluminium. Uh, pure aluminium has very good electrical conductivity. In fact, if you take account of the density of aluminium, then the electrical conductivity is actually twice that of copper. So there is a major application of aluminium in these overhead cables, which have high electrical conductivity, which you need in order to minimize losses, and uh, a low density as well. Now, unfortunately, pure aluminium is not very strong. It's got a strength of about 10 megapascals. Okay? So what you do is you of course, you can precipitation harden it to increase its strength, but whatever you do to put impurities, if you like, inside aluminum will reduce the electrical conduct conductivity. So, to reinforce the aluminum, you have steel wires along with the aluminum cables to provide the strength. And you need that strength not simply in order to support the weight of the cable, but also because you know, if you get condensation on the aluminium and ice forming on the aluminium, then, you know, it can collapse. The cable can actually collapse. So, aluminium is extremely good for electrical conductivity. So, for overhead cables, it beats copper by a long distance. Now, one of the problems with aluminium is, of course, its low density. So, if you're making electrical windings for motors, uh, there is a restriction on space. Okay. You, you want your motor to be as small physically as possible in, in some circumstances. And there, copper windings are used because copper has a higher density. Question? Yeah. How about like household appliances? Why is it magnesium uh, used over, or aluminum used over copper in those wires? In house, uh, the wires that go in houses? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, of course, these wires have been around for a long time, you know. Uh, ideally, aluminum could be used if you can tolerate larger diameters. But if you run a large, like a, 
how he can do the house. Yeah, no problem with aluminium. Then why is it not used? It is. It is. Yeah, it is used. Uh, the joining of aluminium wires is also different from the joining of copper. So if there's a lot of soldering involved, then you would use copper instead of aluminium because aluminium has this oxide film. There are different techniques for joining aluminium wires. So in electrical circuit boards, you'll find copper. Yeah. So pure aluminium, its uh, major use is really in uh, um, electrical conductivity, electrical application. Now, aluminium has a cubic F crystal structure at all temperatures in its solid state. Okay? So we can't design its microstructure by, all, by using phase transformations. Okay? So it remains as cubic F. Cubic F is phase center cubic. Okay? <coughs> yeah, stop me if you have any questions, okay? Because I might assume something has been taught in previous courses. So the major way in which, all, in which we alter the properties of aluminium is precipitation hardening, solid solution hardening, and coal deformation. So that means simply working it to introduce more and more defects. And there's a number of things which determine the solubility of various solids in aluminium. But what I'd like you to appreciate is that solubility is not something that's that you can define for a single phase. Solubility is always with respect to something else. So for example here, this line represents the solubility of copper in alpha, which is in equilibrium with CuAl2. And notice that the solubility of copper in alpha with respect to liquid is different. Okay, so if I extrapolated that phase boundary to lower temperatures, the solubility of copper in alpha which is in equilibrium with liquid would be different from solubility of copper in alpha with respect to CuAl2. So I can't say that, look, the solubility of copper in alpha is so much. I have to also say that it's in equilibrium with another phase. That's, that's the meaning of solubility. And there are two basic time types of phase diagrams that we get when we add a variety of elements aluminium. This phase diagram uh, you might be familiar with. What sort of a phase diagram label would I give it? Eutectic. Exactly. Because we have liquid here of this composition decomposing into a mixture of alpha, which is a solid solution of copper in aluminium, and CuAl2, which is an intermetallic compound. We, we call this a compound because it has a very narrow composition range. Okay. It, it's not really different from the solid solution, but the range of solubility of copper uh, or aluminium in this compound is very narrow. So that's the difference between a compound and a solid solution, that if I plot the free energy as a function of copper, then alpha might have quite a wide range of solubility, uh, of, um, you know, its free energy varies gently with the amount of copper, whereas CuAl2 is almost a stoichiometric compound, a very narrow range of solubility because the free energy increases sharply as you deviate from that stoichiometric composition. Now, of course, what I can do with this system is I can take an alpha solid solution from a high temperature and cool it rapidly to a lower temperature so that I have excess copper in solid solution and then I can age it at a constant temperature to precipitate that copper in a variety of forms to produce precipitation hardening. And age hardening was actually first discovered by Guinea and Preston in aluminium copper alloys. So are you familiar with GP zones? GP stands for Guinea Preston. So when you age copper aluminium alloys, you first get the clustering of copper atoms. And that clustering forms uh, zones of copper, copper atoms which are fully coherent with the matrix, but they have strain fields around them, so they give rise to hardening because dislocations interfere with the strain fields around those clusters of atoms. As you continue to age, those clusters of copper atoms become bigger in the form of 
disks of copper atoms, and those are known as the GP2 zones. Do you remember that? Further aging will lead to a loss of coherency because there's a mismatch in the lattice parameters between the zones and the aluminium. And as the precipitate gets larger, you get a breakdown of coherency and you have semi-coherent precipitates with in interface dislocations. So dislocation can no longer penetrate through those precipitates and that is the hardening mechanism. And finally, you get the incoherent CuAl2 precipitate, which is coarse and tends to be large and therefore it doesn't cause much hardening. Okay? So during the aging process, the hardness goes to a peak and finally drops when we end up with coarse CuAl2 precipitates. Everybody happy with that? Okay. Now there are many solids which... Yes? Um, you've got no allotropic transition mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good question. So allotropic means I can change the crystal structure without changing the chemical composition. So for example, if you take uh, titanium, it exists pure titanium, it's 40 centered cubic at high temperature, but hexagonal closed back at low temperatures. If you take iron, it's cubic F at 1000 degrees centigrade, but it becomes 40 centered cubic at a low temperature. So there's no composition change there, but a change of crystal structure. So pure aluminium only exists as cubic F in the solid state. Now, this is the second kind of phase diagram that you get with aluminium alloys. Uh, it looks different from the eutectic phase diagram, where we had you know, liquid of this composition decomposing into a mixture of alpha and CuAl2. Do you recognize this phase diagram? The label for this phase diagram? Yes. Peritactic. Now, peritactic, think about it as an upside-down eutectic. Okay? So instead of one phase decomposing into a mixture of two phases, we have liquid of this composition reacting with CrAl7 of this composition to generate alpha solid solution. Okay, so it's liquid plus, in this case, CrAl7 decomposing to give alpha. So these are actually reacting together to produce alpha. So this is called a peritactic reaction where you have liquid and another phase reacting together to produce alpha. Now, when you have a eutectic reaction, that is liquid going to alpha plus, let's say, CuAl2, you might have a microstructure which looks like this. CuAl2, CuAl2, and liquid. <coughs> so these two phases are growing together and solute is being distributed at the transformation front. Peritactic, on the other hand, if I look at an alloy of this composition, I'll start with a mixture of liquid and CrAl7. So let's say this is a particle of CrAl7 and it's surrounded by liquid. You'll form a layer of alpha around here by the peritactic reaction. Now the trouble is that diffusion now, in order for the liquid and this compound to react, has to happen through the alpha phase. And as the alpha becomes thicker and thicker, that reaction will become slower and slower. So peritactic reactions are notorious for not reaching completion. It, it, you really have to carry out that reaction extremely slowly for it to reach equilibrium and for complete reaction to happen. So very frequently you find that the microstructure has not uh, gone to a perfect paradactic and we're left with a non-equilibrium microstructure. And of course, the solid state version of a paradactic is called a paradactoid. Just like we have a eutectic and a eutectoid, the eutectoid involves solid state transformation. In solid state, this would be incredibly slow. Because, again, as this phase becomes thicker and thicker, solid-state diffusion becomes more and more difficult. 
So these are the two basic types of phase diagrams <coughs> that you get when you add a whole variety of solutes. So I, I've only presented here chromium, but you can have a variety of solutes which will show either the peritactic or the taptic type of phase diagram. And from the point of view of precipitation strengthening, uh, notice that you know the solubility of solute in alpha decreases as you go down in temperature. And that's what we use to strengthen aluminium and its alloys. I want to uh, show you that when we form metastable precipitates, that means precipitates which are not thermodynamically the most stable phases, but kinetically they are favored because they are easy to nucleate. For example, in the aluminium copper system, it's really CuAl2, which is the stable phase. But it's not the first one to form because it's got an incoherent interface. And the large interface energy means that it's difficult to nucleate. Yep. So you get a large activation energy for nucleation. So instead you get the GP1 zones forming which have a coherent interface and which are easier to nucleate. So although this is the equilibrium phase diagram here, yeah? okay. we don't get the equilibrium precipitate forming first because it's difficult to nucleate. It's thermodynamically more stable and it will eventually replace the GB zones, but these are very easy to nucleate because of their coherency with the matrix. Okay. So if you look at the free energy as a function of concentration, then clearly CuAl2 is the most stable phase, and nevertheless, we first precipitate GB zones. Now, do you remember that to find equilibrium compositions, we draw a common tangent to those free energy curves? Because so here, for example, is the common tangent to CuAl2 and alpha. And if I plot the locus of these points here as a function of temperature, then I get the equilibrium phase boundary. Okay. Notice that because GP1 is not the most stable phase, the solubility in alpha of copper with respect to GP1 is larger. Okay. So the metastable phase boundary actually has a larger solubility for copper than if we precipitated the equilibrium phase. So not only does GB1 form first, but the amount of GB1 that forms is limited by this metastable phase boundary rather than the equilibrium phase boundary. And ultimately, as you carry on aging, uh, CuAl2 will replace GB1. So whenever we have a metastable precipitate, the solubility of solute in the matrix will tend to be higher with respect to that phase. So if I, if I quenched alpha to this temperature, I would not precipitate GP1. It's not possible. You are in between this point and this point. So we haven't exceeded the solubility of copper with respect to GP1. So I have to undercool to a higher temperature, uh, a lower temperature, in order to get GP1 precipitation. Okay, is that clear? Right, uh, I want to describe to you an easy way of calculating the solubility of a solute in a phase. Now, you may be familiar with these free energy plots, which are free energies of mixing as a function of the concentration of a solute. And you're aware that the free energy of mixing consists of two terms. One term is the enthalpy of mixing, and another term is the entropy of mixing. So even if I have a zero <coughs> entropy of mixing, I will get a reduction in free energy if I add a solid to a, uh, to a solvent, simply because I can find many more configurations of atoms when the impurity is added. So if I have an absolutely pure lattice, uh, then there's only one way of arranging the atoms. But if I add a single atom of impurity, 
then I can have a very large number of new arrangements. And that gives me an entropy of mixing, which is basically minus r into x log x plus 1 minus x log 1 minus x. You, you remember this from your part 1a lectures, where you did the thermodynamics of solutions. Does this look familiar? And we obtain this simply by counting the number of different arrangements as a function of concentration and applying the Boltzmann equation which says the entropy is k log w, where w is the number of arrangements. So, a solution where we only have an entropy of mixing, but no entropy of mixing, is called an ideal solution. That means if I break an A bond, break a BB bond to form two AB bonds, then there is no change in bond energy. The atoms are indifferent to the kinds of neighbors they have. So if it only has an entropy, mm -hmm. no entropy. That's correct. So this is the this is a case. Look. Uh, where the entropy of mixing is zero. Nevertheless, we have a reduction in free energy when we add the solid because we change the number of configurations. Now, supposing that there is a change in binding energy when I break an AF bond, a BB bond, to form two AB bonds, then that change can be of two kinds. One is that there is a reduction in bond energy. In other words, A atoms prefer to be next to B atoms. So that would be a system where you get a minimum in free energy when you have equal numbers of A and B atoms. Okay, so this is, this is uh, you would have a shape which looks like this, but lower, okay. a larger free energy of mixing, because the entropy of mixing is negative. On the other hand, if A atoms prefer to be next to A atoms, you know, they like their own kind, then you can get a shape which looks like this, with minima at the A-rich and B-rich regions. So they tend to cluster. And a lot of the aluminium alloys are like that. Like when you add copper, for example, to aluminium, you tend to form copper-rich and aluminium-rich regions. So there you would get a free energy curve which has two minima in it at low temperatures. Are you happy with that? <coughs> now, in order to plot a system where we have the clustering of like atoms, I can draw a common tangent to this curve and find the aluminium rich and the copper rich regions. So here, for example, are the aluminium rich and copper rich phase boundaries. Now, of course, this curve is interrupted by the formation of that eutectic reaction, but supposing we didn't have melting and we didn't have the eutectic reaction, then you would end up with a shape like this. At very high temperatures, it doesn't matter that the entropy of mixing is positive, everything will tend to mix up. So this is what we call a miscibility gap that you have a single solution which tends to split into aluminium-rich and copper-rich regions. It becomes immiscible. Okay. So this is known as miscibility gap, and that's what gives you these phase boundaries in your phase diagram. Now, if you look at all these curves, they're symmetrical about 0 0.5. What I want to do is I want to calculate this phase boundary here. And I do that by drawing a common tangent. But because these curves are symmetrical, about 0.5, that common tangent will give me points which correspond to the minimum. Now that's not necessarily true if the free energy curve is asymmetrical. Because look, this point doesn't correspond to the minimum. So I'm just going to mathematically simplify things by saying that the common tangent construction corresponds to the minima because this particular solution model we are using, everything is symmetrical, about 0.5. Okay. But the essence of what I'm going to say doesn't change even if you have asymmetrical curves. I don't want you to go away with the impression that 
the minima in those free energy curves correspond to the common tangent contact points in general. Right, so to find those minima, I take uh, my expression for the free energy of mixing. So this is the free energy of mixing. This is basically the configurational entropy of mixing, where n with the subscript a is Avogadro's number, Boltzmann is constant. So this term you're familiar with is the contribution from the entropy of mixing. This term here is the contribution from the enthalpy of mixing, where 1 minus x is the concentration of A, x is the concentration of B. Z is a coordination number because the number of bonds that you form depends on how many atoms you have surrounding a particular atom. And omega here is simply the change in binding energy when I take an A bond, a BB bond, and form two AB bonds from, from that. So that's the equation for the free energy of mixing. If I differentiate that with respect to x, sorry, in the in your, okay, okay. Um, what I I can do is uh, I have this slide presentation on on the web. Yeah. We do have. We do have. Oh, you have both. Okay. Yeah, so it's up to the slide. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Maybe I should change the order there. Okay. Okay, so if I now differentiate this with respect to x and set that to zero, then that gives me the condition for finding the minima. So I get this equal to zero and the concentration of solute in alpha as a function of temperature varies exponentially with temperature. And that's why we have phase diagrams. solute and phase boundaries look like this yeah? so that's exponential variation of solubility as a function of temperature so in order to calculate this phase boundary which is the most important boundary in the heat treatment of aluminium alloys we only need one term for a given solute yeah. so if you have a table of the value of omega for a particular element that you add to aluminium then you should be able to calculate this phase boundary and therefore work out at what temperature all the solute is in solution and if you go down to this temperature how much excess solute do you have in solution so this is a very neat way of actually designing heat treatments for aluminium alloys you only need <coughs> one number here to calculate this phase boundary so here for example uh, this is a plot against uh, logarithm and 1 upon t. So if I go back to this equation and I take the logarithm over here and plot against 1 upon t, then I should get a straight line. And that is indeed what you get for a whole variety of solutes that you can add to aluminium. And copper here has a, a small value of omega and therefore it has the largest solubility in aluminium. So what we've done is, you know, we've used the elementary thermodynamic theory that you've done previously for solutions and from that you've derived an equation for the solubility of solute in aluminium and if you have knowledge of one single parameter omega then you're able to calculate these solubility lines as a function of temperature so these lines are exactly this it's simply plotted differently so you can find tabulations of omega and therefore you can design your heat treatment problem. Now, there's one problem with precipitation strengthening of aluminium which is quite an important problem. Now can you see in this microstructure <coughs> that you know, here we have a grain boundary between two alpha grains. There is a region here after heat treatment which is almost free from precipitates okay. and that's what we call a precipitate free zone mm -hmm. now any ideas why we get these zones <laughs> 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 yeah. 
But nucleation first happens at a grain boundary, which is a very strong defect. And imagine that you have a grain boundary here. And if I have <coughs> a precipitate over here, then there is a gain because I've destroyed some of that defect in the process of forming that particle. I've destroyed some of the boundary, right? And that's the reason why grain boundaries are very good nucleation sites. If I form the same precipitate here, I don't have that gain. I haven't destroyed some of the defect, right? So it's much easier to form at the boundary than inside the grain. So these particles form first. And Sorry, yeah. what does destroying the mean by destroying the yeah. Can you illustrate that again? Yes, yes. So let me draw this again. I've got the, a grain boundary. And if I form a precipitate here, mm -hmm. I've created that much new interface between the precipitate and the matrix. If I form a precipitate here, I've, I've created the same amount of interface between the precipitate and the matrix, but I have, in the process, removed this much grain boundary. That is a gain, because this also has energy per unit area. So it's favorable to form here than here. So this will form first, before anything forms inside the matrix. And as it forms, it draws solute from here and here. And therefore, you remove supersaturation from that region, and you don't get any precipitation. So you've got strong matrix, soft area near the grain boundary. It's the worst possible scenario, because you will focus strain when you deform it in that region. Is there any other mechanism by which we get precipitate-free zones? One is solute depletion because of precipitation at the boundary. Vacancy depletion. This is just a, a lower magnification image showing you precipitate-free zones. But this is an interesting image. Uh, there are no precipitates here, but this is a material. When we quench from a high temperature, you not only retain excess solute, but you also retain excess vacancies, because the vacancy concentration is larger at high temperatures. Right? If I cool rapidly, then I will retain that high vacancy concentration at low temperatures. Yeah. Now, of course, a grain boundary is a very good sink for vacancies. The vacancy can migrate to the boundary and disappear because the grain boundary has dislocations. And you know, if I, if I draw a dislocation here and add a vacancy, then it simply climbs to another plane. Okay? So it's a very good sink for dislocations. Now the other thing that can happen when I quench from a high temperature is that these excess vacancies condense. If they can't find a grain boundary, they condense to form a dislocation loop. So these are the dislocation loops which are formed by the precipitation of vacancies. But there are no dislocation loops in the vicinity of the boundary. Now these are good nucleation sites for precipitates, but we can't nucleate precipitates here because we don't have defects to nucleate on. So when precipitates start to form, even if there is no solute depletion here, you won't get precipitation. Okay, because there is a depletion of vacancies, which are defects, which help to nucleate precipitates. So this is a case where we do have excess solute here, but we don't have the vacancies which have sunk into the grain boundary to help nucleate the particles. There are two reasons, uh, two mechanisms by which we can form precipitate-free zones. One is solute depletion and one is vacancy depletion. Okay. Now, if I go back to this slide, um, the other big problem with having precipitate-free zones is that the chemical composition here can be different from the chemical composition in the matrix. So you have different electrochemical properties in that zone compared with here. 
And that means that you focus corrosion in this narrow region. Okay, so you have a large cathodic area and a small anodic area. And the corrosion current has to be, current density, will be much higher in this region than in this region. So precipitation hardened aluminum alloys containing precipitate free zones are very susceptible to corrosion, localized corrosion. That's why when we make aircraft, you know, we have to have strong aluminum alloys which are precipitation strengthened. Uh, the alloys are clad with pure aluminium. Okay, so what you see on the outside is a thin layer of pure aluminium by roll bonding. Okay. And inside is the precipitation strengthened aluminium. So you make it much more corrosion resistant by cladding it with pure aluminium. So when you actually look at an aircraft, you're not looking at the aluminium copper alloys, but there's a thin layer of pure aluminium which prevents this corrosion problem. Okay. Now, there is some jargon that you need to learn because it, is, it, is, uh, it pervades all of the aluminium industry. And this is the classification scheme for aluminium alloys. And if you go into industry or if you go to buy aluminium alloys, then they won't uh, be able to talk to you about the metallurgy of it. But they will say, is this one XXX or is it 6XX that you want? Okay? So I need to teach you some jargon from within the aluminium industry. The XXX simply means that I can have different numbers for pure aluminium alloys with some different characteristics. Okay? But 99% pure aluminium alloys fall in the 1XXX category. So you might have a 1101 type alloy, but it's basically pure aluminium and it's mostly used uh, for electrical conductivity, as I said before. This series of alloys are the copper-containing age-hardening alloys uh, used for making aircraft uh, skins and so on. So they are strong alloys because they are precipitation strengthened. Here we have precipitation strengthening with small concentrations of manganese. You form aluminum manganese into metallic compounds. These are casting alloys, so aluminum silicon casting alloys. And you precipitate almost pure silicon. Now, silicon has a diamond crystal structure. Okay, so it's a cubic athletis with a motif of two silicon atoms, one at zero, 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 and one at a quarter, quarter, quarter. So it has a low density. So when you cast something and you precipitate silicon, it compensates for the contraction of the liquid as it solidifies. So it makes for a very good casting alloy. So if you look at the engine blocks in mo modern cars, they used to be made out of cast iron, but they're now made, almost all of them are made out of aluminum silicon alloys because it's got a lower density than cast iron. You might have a lining of steel or cast iron in the, uh, you know, where the pistons are, but essentially it's aluminum silicon alloys. Uh, these alloys are used in marine applications. They contain large concentrations of magnesium of the order of 3 to 4 weight percent to help give uh, corrosion resistance. <coughs> and then we get to specialized alloys here. For example, here we might have oxide dispersion strengthened aluminum where we deliberately introduce aluminum into the material. There are also designations for heat treatments. So if I buy a 2XXX alloy in the F condition, that means it's basically as you've received it from the supplier. Okay? So without any particular treatment, it's as fabricated. O stands for anneal, H for strain hardened, that means cold deformed. T is uh, a reference number for heat treatment and T4 means solution treated and aged at room temperature whereas T6 means solution treated and aged deliberately at a higher temperature. And there are many more of these terms but the essence of it is that we have a number to specify the alloy composition roughly and another letter to specify the state of the material. If I say to you this is in the T6 condition, that means it's solution treated and precipitation hardened. So just to finish off, uh, this is a very major product 
made from aluminium. You know, billions and billions of. Yeah. This is probably a really stupid question. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very good question actually. <laughs> yeah, heat treated means you've done it specifically in order to produce, for example, precipitation strengthening. Okay. Annealing is reserved for a case where you have cold deformed the material, produce lots of defects like dislocations, and you're trying to get rid of those defects. Okay. So you're not, uh, there's no phase transformation there, you're simply reducing the defect density. Is the actual process the same then? The, yeah, you put uh, it you in put your furnace. <laughs> That's right. But yeah. but the important difference is that there's no phase transformation in annealing. Okay. So if you're annealing a steel, you would not go above the intact temperature. But in heat treating, you would desire phase transformation or something yeah. that you. That's correct. But physically, I mean, you're still putting the sample into a furnace to heat treat. Yeah. yeah. That's Okay, so beverage cans, really very, very major application for the aluminum industry. And it's this system of alloys that is used for making beverage cans. Either aluminum manganese with a small concentration of manganese, or aluminum manganese magnesium with magnesium giving you the um, solid solution hardening. And they're used in the hardened or the annealed condition. Now, the most important characteristic of the material that's used for making aluminium is crystallographic texture. Because what you want to do is you want to make a can which you can deep draw. So you can make a really deep can out of extremely thin material. So you have to minimize the plastic strain in the thickness direction. If you arrange your crystals in such a way that the deformation is concentrated in the plane of your material, then you can get really deep cans and yet have a very thin can. So, you know, these cans are now so thin that you can tear them and do yourself a great deal of damage, you know, by cutting yourself. They are so thin that they would not be able to support their own weight if there was no pressure in the can. And that, that is why, you know, when you buy baked beans, they're not made out of aluminium cans. They're made out of steel because there's no pressure in them. Okay. Go ahead. But when you open the can... Uh, but then you're not stacking them, you see? You know, for, for transportation uh, and shops and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. It would be really funny if you opened it. And it collapsed, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this, this is a very, very big business. And we need to make the <coughs> top of the can from a stronger alloy than the bottom, simply because here you want to break the can in a very neat way without cutting yourself when you're drinking. So if you recycle this, you no longer have a canning alloy yeah. because you're going to mix up these two different elements. Uh, this is uh, small uh, marine applications where you make uh, out of 5x excess alloys which contain magnesium, which gives strength and corrosion resistance. So this is about 3 to 4 weight percent of magnesium. And of course, uh, aluminium alloys thrive in the aircraft industry because basically they are strong and have, uh, have a low density. Yeah. Sorry, what was... No. Okay, Sorry. yeah. <laughs> okay, now, just to finish off completely, um, when we precipitation strengthen aluminium with coherent particles, the fatigue properties are extremely poor. The reason why they're poor is, supposing this is a coherent particle, then coherency means there's a continuity of lattice planes. Okay, there might be elastic strains, but there's a continuity of lattice planes from the matrix through the precipitate. You happy with that? The meaning of coherency? Yeah, so if this is my coherent particle, I might get a change in spacing, but there's complete continuity. So a dislocation can go through the particle, and it will leave a staff here. 
So it makes it easier for another dislocation to go through it because we decrease the area here. So slip tends to become planar. And that means that you produce slip steps on the surface, which are quite large, which are exactly the size for fatigue cracking as well. Okay. So sorry? This is a dislocation, yeah. Yeah. and the dislocation has a bogus vector, doesn't it? So it causes a displacement of the top half with respect to the bottom half mm -hmm. by a distance which is the bogus vector. At first, the dislocation had to go through that much precipitate. Now, it's only got to go through this much precipitate. So it becomes easier for a second dislocation to carry on on that plane. And therefore you get planar slip instead of dislocation moving on many, many different planes. And that produces slip steps, macroscopic slip steps on the surface of your component, which are stress concentrations, and you get fatigue crack initiation. So for fatigue applications, <coughs> you need to make your precipitates semi-coherent or incoherent. Coherent precipitates are bad news for fatigue. Okay, that finishes today's lecture.